Hi, good day everyone and welcome to this course. This is Taxation 231, which is Income Taxation. I am your coach, your moderator, and an instructor, attorney in London A. Masarin. And I'm also a CPA or a certified public accountant. I'm a real estate broker. I have a doctorate on uh, jurisprudence. I have also a master's degree in business administration and working on my doctorate on business administration. So chapter one is about the general principles of and concepts of taxation. So our first topic would be taxation as an inherent power of the state. Inherent power, now the state has, or the government, has three inherent powers, namely police power, eminent domain, and taxation. So what do you mean by inherent? Inherent is uh, meaning it, it automatically uh, comes out when a state is conceived. You know? It's just like a child. When a child is conceived, it has already automatically a heart, and the heart starts beating. So just like a baby or a child, a state, when it is conceived, taxation automatically comes in as one, as one of its inherent powers. Okay, let's discuss taxation, police power, and eminent domain. Now, police power is also an inherent power of the state, which is the right of the government to pass laws and regulations in order to promote good health, public order, and safety in the society. It is when the interest of the few should be sacrificed for the interest of the majority. So an example of a police power is uh, quarantine loss during COVID-19. That is police power. Well, the power of the state to, uh, to isolate us in our residences, that we should not come out in the open to avoid getting this ill-driven disease. So that is uh, police power that, see, to promote good health. So this quarantine state that we are in is a police power, is the uh, exercise of police power of our government. Another inherent power is the eminent domain. This is also an inherent power which is the right of the state to expropriate, whereby the government can forcibly acquire private property for public use, but upon just compensation. So there should be payment that is a requirement of due process of law. So in its exercise of expropriation or imminent domain, the state, example of this would be, the state would take out properties of, owned by private persons. And just like in what has happening in road widening or in the planting of posts, like uh, uh, the National Power or the NGCP, which is the National Grid Corporation of the State, who are who is in charge of putting the transmission lines of electricity now if your property would be uh, encroach of those power lines or power posts then the state will take your private property but it is required that the state should pay the owner of that property so that is the power of eminent domain And lastly, the power of taxation. It is the right of the government to collect enforced contribution, known as tax, through the law-making body in order to have funds to support the government. So incidentally, the power of tax is not granted in the Constitution 
constitutional provisions related to the power of the tax taxation do not operate as grants of the power of taxation, but instead it merely constitute limitations on the power because taxation is without limit. So, basing on this uh, definition, the government collects enforced contribution. Enforced meaning you have on the part of the spare, you cannot refuse to collect once the government demands you to pay tax because it is enforced. No? You are compelled by the state to pay taxes and the purpose of which is to have funds in order that the government will survive to support the government. Now we will differentiate taxation from the rest of the inherent powers, which are the eminent domain and the power, police power. Now, the first, the first differentiation would be as to who exercises the power. So in taxation, this is only exercised by the government, okay? Or it's political subdivision. This political subdivision means here the law government like the city of Cebu, the city of Dalisai, and the rest of the local governments, no? like Cebu province, this local government. So taxation can only be exercised by the government and the rest of the local governments. While eminent domain can be exercised by private companies. As I've said, it can be taken by the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines, who is in charge of taking private, uh, installing electricity lines, uh, transmission lines. Is that the state? No, it is a corporation, but that corporation is uh, owned by the state. So here, so eminent domain is granted to public service companies or public utilities. So electricity is a public utility, okay? So it's also exercised by the government, like when the government takes private property for road widening, you know? While police power is exercised only by the government and the local governments. Now let's go to purpose. This is the second differentiation. differentiation or distinction. So the purpose of taxation is generally uh, in form of money and taken for the support of the government. So only on mo in money. You know? The government does not take any kind of uh, or payment in kind. So you cannot pay your taxes uh, by bringing your chicken or your pig or your carabao in the office of the BIR, no. Once you are demanded to pay tax, you have to pay in money, not in kind or in property. So while in eminent domain, the purpose is to take pub property for public use, but it must be paid. In police power, the power is to regulate I mean, the taking of the property is to regulate for the purpose of promoting the general welfare. So there is no payment in this uh, matter. So general welfare includes the health, good health, the felicity or extreme happiness of the people, uh, the good environment, good educational system, and so on and so forth. That is general welfare. Now, let's go to the third distinction. As to persons affected, taxation only affects certain, uh, uh, the whole community or a certain class of individuals. While eminent domain operates only on the individual, the owner, who is the owner of the property? If you are the owner of the property that's taken for public use, then you are the only person affected. But in taxation, it operates upon 
a community or a class of individuals. There is no discrimination, just like in police power. No? So if the president says that you should stay in your houses, there is no, there is no exception. If, of course, exception are those frontliners who are taking care of the sick, like the doctor, the nurses, med tech, and all the other uh, profess professions in the medical field, and also the police force. So only those who are in the front line. I'm talking about uh, COVID-19, no? because police power, one of its uh, function is to uh, quarantine the community or impose quarantine. The fifth distinction would be as to effect taxation. In taxation, the money contributed becomes part of the treasury funds or the public funds, while the, uh, in eminent domain, the transfer is only the right to property. So the property, the property does not form part of the treasury funds or public funds. Now in police power, there is no transfer of title, and most there is restraint on the injurious use of the property. So we can no longer use our property, you know? Like there is no swimming pool, you're not allowed to swim in public swimming pools, so because of the COVID-19. Continue, we'll continue dis distinguishing. The sixth distinction would be as the benefits received. Now in taxation, the, it is assumed that the individual receives the equivalent of the tax in the form of protection and the benefits he receives from the government. So the protection, by paying taxes, you are protected by the state. Now in eminent domain, the owner of the property receives the market value of the property, which is taken from him by the state. While in police power, the person affected receives indirect benefits as may arise from the maintenance of a healthy economic standard of society. So indirect. So that would be the not contacting this contagious disease. Let's go to the sixth distinction, and that is to amount of imposition. Generally, in taxation, there is no limit on the amount of tax that may be imposed. In eminent domain, there is no amount imposed, but rather the owner is paid the market value of the property taken. While in police power, the amount imposed should not be more than is sufficient to cover the cost of license and necessary expenses. Now they're talking about license here. So if you are going to take a driver's license or a business license, so that is an exercise of police power, you know? Or if you are going to, uh, to register your car, that is an exercise of police power. So you're only going to pay what is the cost of re registering your car. So there is no profit involved here. Now, as the last distinction would be as to relationship to constitution. Now, the taxation is only limited by the, tax, the constitution. See, it's limited. We'll discuss that later. Including the prohibition against impairment of obligations of contracts. So contracts cannot be impaired. The in in eminent domain, it is inferior to the impairment prohibition, just like in taxation. And then the government cannot expropriate private property, which under a contract it had previously bound itself to purchase from the other contracting party. So meaning if there is already a person who's, who has already made a contract with the owner of the property, that they are going, that he's going to buy from the owner this property, then the state cannot come in to impair that contract. 
gets. So that is the imminent domain. While in police power, as to the relation to the constitution, it is not limited by the constitution and it is superior to the impairment provisions. So this impairment provision is also in the constitution, okay? This is uh, discussing the impairment clause. That's what we have discussed in the previous slide, which is here. Impairment. Yeah? So what is this impairment clause? So the non-impairment clause in the Constitution is found in Section 10, Article 3 of the Constitution. It says that no law impairing the obligations of contracts shall be passed. So the impairment is anything that diminishes the efficacy of a contract. So those that would change the terms and conditions of the original contract over one contracting party's obligation. So if there's a law that is passed by Congress and it impairs or prejudiced the obligations and rights which a contract uh, that is not allowed, no, it is prohibited under the non impairment clause. So, if taxation comes in and impairs a contract, it is prohibited. While eminent domain comes in and impairs a contract, it's again prohibited. So, there's another uh prohibition here which is ex post facto law what is this this refers only to criminal matter and this prohibits its retroactive application so if the law would retroact like it comes it is effective on uh, an earlier date then it cannot be uh, passed or it cannot be valid because it prejudiced the rights of the accused. It's number three. So in taxation, it could work. Uh, it can't be applied in taxation or eminent domain. So in, in ex post facto law, it is required that every law that makes criminal an action done before the passage of the law in which was innocent when done and punishes such action. So that aggravates a crime or makes it greater than it was when committed. It changes punishment and inflicts a greater punishment than the law annexed to the crime when it committed. It alters the legal rules of evidence and receives less or, or different testimony when the law required. So which assuming to regulate civil rights and remedies so it deprives persons accused of a crime of some lawful protection to which they have become entitled. So all, all in all, the ex post facto law is matters, refers to a uh, criminal matter. So it, if it is taxation, then the tax now, when you are, when you have committed this, let's say, for example, a taxpayer has committed a violation and the penalty before is only 1,000 pesos. But now here comes the law. Those who have violated Republic Act 8424, which is the uh, National Internal Revenue Code or the NIRC or the Taxation Code before. So if you have violated Article uh, Republic Act 8424, the law now, requires you that your penalty would be 1 million pesos instead of 1,000 pesos. And you have to pay, even though you have committed the violation way back in 1980, about 40 years ago. That is retroactive in application. Can that be? So certainly it cannot, no? Taxation is only pros uh, 
perspective in application, meaning it cannot be applied retroactively or backwards. No? It can only be applied forward or prospectively. So here, retroactive. The opposite is prospective. Now we define taxation. It is uh, inherent power of the sovereign or the state through the legislative branch raises revenue to defray the necessary expenses of the government. So it is a mode of raising revenue for public purpose. The power of the state to impose a charge or burden of persons, property, and rights for the use and support of the government so that the latter, meaning the government, may be able to discharge its proper functions. So stated otherwise, taxation is the method of apportioning the cost of government among those who in some measure are privileged to enjoy its benefits and must therefore bear its burden. Another definition is that it is a symbiotic relationship, meaning it, it's a mutual relationship whereby in exchange for the protection that the citizen get from the government, the citizen pays tax. This is uh, uh, here, Commissioner versus Alge. This is a case. No? This is uh, a ruling of the Supreme Court. In the case of Commissioner versus Alge, which is uh, docketed as L-28896 and promulgated in, on February 17, 1988. But if you would, if I were you, you would memorize the first one. That it is an inherent power of the state through the legislative branch, raises revenue to defray the necessary expenses of the government. That is already sufficient. So what is the nature of taxation? So the nature of taxation is twofold. The first would be it is an attribute of sovereignty because it is an inherent power of the state. So the power of taxation is an essential and inherent attribute of sovereignty. Belonging as a matter of right to every independent government without being expressly conferred by the people. So without even conferring or enacting laws, the power of taxation comes in because it is inherent, because it is essential. So in, uh, we have a bar question here. Why is the power to tax considered inherent sovereignty? It is considered inherent in the sovereign state because it is necessary attribute of sovereignty. See? It is a necessary attribute of sovereignty. Without this power, no sovereign state can exist nor endure. The power of the tax proceeds from, proceeds from the theory that the existence of the government is a necessity. The power of the tax is an essential and inherent attribute of sovereignty belonging as a matter of right to every independent state. So no state can exist without the means to pay its expenses. So therefore, taxation is essential. Okay. The second would be, the second fold would be that taxation is legislative it's a legislative process and the scope of taxation is that discretion as to the purpose for which taxes shall be levied. Discretion as to the subject of taxation and the situs of taxation. So, meaning the legislative has discretion as to the purpose why you implement taxes. As to the subject of taxation, so it could be a property, could be a uh, a person in the exercise of his profession. So, situs of taxation, meaning the place 
So as to the place of taxation, so it could be national or local, but not extraterritorial, meaning not outside the country. So the legislative has the discretion as to the amount or rate of tax to be imposed. Also, they have the discretion as to the mode or method or classification or kind of tax. <coughs> Excuse me. And the power of taxation is essentially a legislative function. So it includes determination of nature or kind, object or purpose, extent, amount of rate, coverage, subjects, and kinds, or objects, apportionment of tax will be general or limited in application, and the status of taxation, which is the place and the method of collection. They also have the power to grant tax exemptions or condonations. And they have also, they can specify or provide administrative as well as judicial remedies that either the government or taxpayers may avail themselves the proper implementation of the tax measure. Okay, so here, it's merely repeated in here. So what's in here, it's also in here. Method is method, mode, situs to situs, the apportionment of tax or the rate of tax, the coverage, extent, the rate. No. So what is in here, it's in here but not the grant of tax exemptions or condonations. So condonations has been discussed in law 231. It is a mode of extinguishing obligation. It is when the creditor waives his right against the obliger or the debtor. So meaning condonation, meaning the well, in, in taxation, if the government waives his right, okay, I know like buy in taxes, after that he condone. So that is condemnation. Or you are now exempted. So legislative, also discussed in law one. What is legislative? It's Congress. No? Congress composed of the upper house and the lower house, which are Senate and the House of Representatives, respectively. But there's another nature which consequently it is generally not delegated to executive or judicial department. So these are the other branches of the state. So you will recall there are three branches, the legislative branch, the executive, and the judicial department. So the power of the legislative to tax cannot be delegated to the executive who is the president and it's Departments, Department of Local Government, Department of uh, National Defense, Department of uh, Health, and the Judicial Department, which is the Supreme Court and all the other lower courts. So they cannot take taxation power from the legislative. And an explanation here by the Supreme Court in the case of Pepsi-Cola Battling Company versus Municipality of Tanawan and Leyte, says, the Supreme Court says that the power to tax is purely legislative in which the central legislative body cannot delegate either to the executive or judicial department of the government without infringing upon the theory of separation of powers. But there are exceptions, no? So the power to delegate, the non-delegability of taxing power, this is a uh, inherent limitation, has exception. And firstly, to local governments in respect of matters of local concern to be exercised by the local legislative bodies. This is found in section five and also in the local government code. Uh, example of this would be the right of uh, the local governments to raise revenues. So in, in Cebu City, for example, they have uh, the con uh, 
council, the Council of Cebu City has enacted an ordinance that whenever you park on the streets or the side streets of Cebu City, you'll be required to pay parking fee. That's why there are now collectors in the streets of Cebu City. So that is the purpose of which is to raise revenue. And this is a mode of taxation. That's an exception, number one. Number two, when allowed by the Constitution. So does Congress may by law authorize the president to fix when it specified limits the subject to which the limitations or restriction may be imposed? The president can fix tariff rates, import and export quotas, tonnage and warfare dues and other duties or imposts within the framework of National Development Program of Government. This is found in Article 6 of the Constitution, specifically Section 28. So Congress or the legislative branch can authorize the President. Okay, Mr. President, you are now authorized to fix the tariff rates, import and export quotas. So what are these? This, this pertains to exportation or importation rates of custom duties no? the tariff rates whatever products that comes in from another country to the philippines then there are uh, tariff rates there are import rates no? so also the weight or the wharfage you know the wharfage the wharf or the pier so you have to pay pier when you dock. When a boat would dock in the in pair six of Cebu City, there's there are warfare Jews. Now who would who is the one the person authorized to make to fix warfare Jews? It is the president through its uh, Department of Transportation. And customs would be the one in charge of uh, in fixing the tariff rates, you know, through the through the departments under the president. Okay, so this this, this is delegated to to uh, for <clears throat> expediency to expedite things. Expedite meaning to to speed up matters no because if this is the de not delegated by congress in congress there are debates and the bill would take up three readings so it would be very time consuming also another exception would be when the delegation relates merely to administrative implementation so that may call for some degree of discretionary powers and the set of sufficient standards expressed by law. So administrative in how to implement the law. So like train law, Congress enacted three train law, which is the, the, the new tax code now. But in, administra in administering the law, it is still very vague or very, they're not, specific rules to make or the mechanics on how to go about it and how to implement the law that's why it is administrative implementation so here come in comes in the bir you know, or the department of finance they would give out the implementing rules and guidelines so this is how to implement the taxation power of the state so they are allowed to give out the administrative rules and implementing guidelines okay we have bar question 2003 May Congress, under the 1987 Constitution, abol abolish the power to tax of local governments. So that was already cited in my example, the parking fee, which is exacted or uh, collected by the local government of Cebu City. The answer is no. 
Congress cannot abolish what is expressly granted by the fundamental law or the Constitution. Now, what is provided there in the Constitution cannot be withdrawn by Congress. So the only authority conferred to Congress is to provide the guidelines and limitations on the local government's exercise of the power to tax. Another, what are we still discussing here? We're discussing the nature of taxation. Another nature of taxation is, it is subject to constitutional and inherent limitations. So taxation, said to be the strongest of all powers of the government because it is unlimited, it is plenary, it is comprehensive and supreme. But in the absence of constitutional restrictions, so there is, there might be abuse in the, in the members of Congress. So that is why the power of taxation is subjected to constitutional and inherent limitations, which we will later discuss. So what are the scope of the powers of legislature in taxation? Already discussed, you know? So the, power, the legislative body has the power to choose the persons, the property, or the occupation to be taxed. So within its jurisdiction of the taxing authority, they can also select the subjects of taxation the amount or rate of tax, the purpose for which a tax to be levied. And it should be for public purpose, the kind of tax to be collected, the apportionment of taxes, whether the tax should be general or limited, or to a particular locality or partly general and partly local. The situs of taxation, the method of taxation, and these are all within the powers of the legislative branch of government, and there could be no judicial intervention meaning the Supreme Court cannot intervene in these areas unless there is, unless there is abuse, because this fall within the area of political question. So if the Supreme Court will come in, hey, you do not know how to pick your rate of tax or the purpose is not, or this kind of tax to be collected is not within your power. So if the Supreme Court does that, then it would be a matter of political question. Okay, so what are the theory or underlying basis of taxation? Meaning why taxation should be imposed? These are the theory. Number one, taxation is the lifeblood of the state. So this is known as the lifeblood theory. So without it, I mean, without it, there's no revenue raised. There's no money. So how can the government survive? You see, if there are no taxes. How can we pay our government employees? How can we uh, construct infrastructure like bridges, roads, so the part, this uh, theory states that taxes is the lifeblood of the government or the state. And without it, government cannot survive. As uh, discussed here in the second paragraph, that taxes, taxation is the indispensable and inevitable price for a civilized society. So without taxes, the government the government would be paralyzed. So this phrase this phrase has been used to justify the validities of the laws, providing for summary remedies in the collection of taxes. As a consequence of the above rule, an injunction against the assessment and collection of taxes is generally withheld by the laws imposing such taxes. So meaning there is no injunction allowed. What is injunction? It is to restrain the power to tax or to collect the tax. So there is no injunction that is allowed. 
So this is the first theory, lifeblood theory. The second is that taxation, the basis of taxation is that it's collected because of this theory, benefit protection theory. So under this theory, taxes are what we pay for a civilized society. So you pay taxes to have a civilized society. How can we have civilized society? Of course, there should be police. There should be police roaming around the city. Okay. If there is no police, then anybody or anyone can have, uh, can be roaming around the city with gun tucked in his waist and just demanding from the sellers or the retailers, hey, I want this product. If you will not give me this product, I will shoot you in the head. So that's why we pay taxes in order that the uh, businessman can be protected. Not only businessmen, but all residents or all the constituents can be protected. So here, despite the natural reluctance to surrender part of their hard and earned income to the government, so you are but every person who is able must contribute his share in running the government. On the other hand, the government in its part is expected to respond in a form of tangible or intangible benefits. How to improve the lives of each and every one of us or to enhance their moral and material values. So this is a symbiotic relationship. And that is the rationality of having taxation. Okay? So it is not arbitrary to exact tax taxes because it is what we are paying for our protection. In a case, the Supreme Court upheld the validity of the anti-TV stamp law. So before in, a, in the, the post office has made a stamp. No? And this is an anti-TV stamp. In order to raise money, in order to, to uh, protect or to have research about TV, to buy medicines for TV because TV before is very highly contagious and there was no, no treatment at all. So here the court held that although no special benefit accrues to male users by such stamp, if you buy the stamp, you don't, you don't benefit from it. No? But it is necessary according to the Supreme Court because it is for public purpose and it's uh, the benefit that the taxpayer, the, the, the buyer of the stamp is not to be uh, con not contacting the disease, the TB or tuberculosis. No? Because before tuberculosis was very dreaded and uh, it's very highly contagious and there was no cure. So people were dying and then they have this anti-TV stamp. So the Supreme Court ruled that it is a valid imposition of tax. So in other case, Supreme Court also ruled that a person cannot object or resist the payment of taxes solely because he has no personal benefit arising from such payment. So you cannot say, I am not paying this tax because I don't benefit from it. I have my bodyguards. I have my security guards at home. So why should I pay you? You see? So that cannot be. Because this is, those who are taxes should be, uh, taxes should be collected from those who are able to contribute. Those who are Earning must contribute. And those who are not earning 
They are not made to pay. Okay, we'll state otherwise the different uh, basis of, of taxation. The first basis is the lifeblood theory. It is stated as otherwise as the necessity theory. So in other authors, it is also known as necessity theory. That uh, taxes proceed from the theory that the existence of the government is a necessity. And it can continue that the means to pay its expenses and the means it has the right to compel, uh, which means that it has the right to compel all citizens and property within its limits to contribute. So within its territory to contribute, you are in my territory and you are earning, you must pay in order that we will survive. The government will survive. The benefit protection theory on the other hand is also stated by other authors as the ability to pay theory. So those who are earning or those who are uh, have the capability to pay a contribution or tax in proportion to their income or revenue that he is enjoying, then he, on the other hand, he gets protection from the state. Okay? So ability to pay theory, also the benefit protection theory, so they are synonymous. So let's discuss the different purposes or the primary purposes of taxation. There are six, I guess. Yes, there are six. The first one is revenue purpose. So revenue is income. Revenue is profit. So what's the distinction between the two? Revenue, profit, and income. Revenue is the term used in uh, governments. No? So they don't use income. They don't use profit, but revenue. So revenue purpose. <clears throat> the government uh, raises this revenue in order to promote public welfare. So I have said public welfare is security, safety, good health, uh, enjoyment of good educational system, enjoyment of good uh, healthcare system, enjoyment of that is public welfare, police uh, uh, enjoyment of security. That is public welfare. Happiness is public welfare. Also, the government raised revenue to fund various infrastructure projects like building bridges, streets. No. Have you gone to a city hall? There's, there's no building. Of course not. Have you gone to courts or uh, like the courts? Have you gone to courts already? Which is uh, found in open space? No, there should be a building. No. So vital to nation building. So the infrastructure projects include buildings, bridges, streets, public parks, and so on and so forth. <coughs> Thirdly, meeting its domestic and international obligations and commitments. So to raise revenue in order to pay uh, our loans, whether domestic or international. So the Philippine government has loans inside, within the, within the nation, because we are borrowing from local banks. So we pay through taxes. Also to foreign banks, we pay. How? Through taxes, collection of taxes. Another purpose is regulatory purpose. <clears throat> regulate from the purpose, from the word regulate. <clears throat> so this is to limit consumption of items which are harmful. So the state would impose taxes to make them more expensive. So example of this would be cigarettes and Alcoholic drinks or liquor, no, because it is, and also sh products who are which are sweet or full of sugar, like Coke, like uh, 
uh, fruit drinks. <coughs> so in under the train law, these products have higher rates compared to uh, before. So the purpose is to regulate. <clears throat> it was found out that a lot of Filipinos die because of diabetes. <clears throat> and what's the cause of diabetes? High intake of sugar. So now those uh, products which have high sugar content are subjected to higher rates of taxes, no? higher tax rates. So now if you notice, Coca-Cola has lesser sugar content than before. And all the other Coca-Cola products like Sprite, Orange, um, uh, Royal, they have less <clears throat> sugar compared to before. <clears throat> also, uh, Pepsi Cola, like Gatorade, they have lower rate, uh, lower sugar content in order to avoid paying higher tax. Of course, cigarettes, they are now very expensive. Why? Because the, the, because the state wants us to limit consuming them. You know? As a matter of fact, our president now prohibits uh, smoking in public places. You know? So the purpose is to promote good health. So this is one regulatory purpose. Another purpose is to promote the general welfare of the people. So taxation may be used as an implement of the police power in order to promote the general welfare of the people because that's the basic, uh, that's a basic uh, purpose of police power, promoting the general welfare of the people. So in the case of Lutz versus Araneta, the Supreme Court upheld the validity of the Sugar Adjustment Act which imposed a tax on milled sugar since the purpose of the law was to strengthen the sugar industry, which undeniably is an industry too vital to the economy. So that's another purpose. The very question is a repetition of what I've discussed already. And the other purposes would be compensatory purpose, meaning to compensate, you know? meaning the poor are given benefits. How? By getting money from the, from the wealthy. So the government makes hospitals out from the taxes, which comes from the wealthy. So who enjoys the benefits of the hospital? Of course, the poor. Yeah? Because this hospital here is a state hospital. Only those who are who have no jobs have, or have jobs but a very low salary. Of course, the wealthy can go to uh, any kind of private, private hospitals because they have the money. Yeah? So. This other purpose, compensatory purpose, is to reduce the social inequality, meaning to distribute the wealth of the of the, the rich, you know, so that the poor can enjoy can enjoy. Okay. Number five, encourage economic growth by granting incentives and exemptions. So that's another objective. So the power to tax and the power to exempt are inherent in the state and in local governments. But the power to condone taxes does not exist. Save in the condemnation of taxes, which can be granted only for certain justifiable reasons expressly stated in the law. So condemnation of taxes applies only to real property taxes. But then there is there are exemptions, no? Of course, it is inherent in the state to grant power exemptions. Now, who are exempted to pay taxes? Do you know who are? Who are them? Of course, the first, first of the minimum income wage earners. <clears throat> Those who are earning minimum wage are 
exempted from paying taxes. Okay? For those who are not income uh, minimum wage earners, but earning below 250,000 pesos a year, also exempted. Okay? And there are other exemptions like uh, senior citizens, they are exempted from paying VAT, uh, PWC, PWDs. They are also exempted from paying uh, VAT in medicines, no? PWDs, persons of. Uh, Or those are physically disabled, okay? Persons with disabilities. Okay. Number six. Another purpose is protectionism. And to whom they are going to protect. This means that the state protects local industries from foreign competition by imposing higher taxes on imported goods. So if the product is coming from China, it should have higher, it should have higher custom rate. No? But this is not, uh, I think this is no longer being, because now comes in China's products here in the Philippines, very cheap compared to local products. How can you protect local products? So the state should impose higher higher uh, customs or tariff rates on importations in order that local industries can be protected from the foreign counterparts. Raise higher custom tariff rates. So what are the characteristics of sound taxation or sound taxation system? There are three. This is also known as canons of taxation. And the first one would be fiscal adequacy, theory, theoretical justice, and administrative feasibility. So fis fiscal adequacy means that the sources of revenue are sufficient to meet the demand of public expenditures and other public needs. So it means that whatever is collected from the by the government should be enough to pay the uh, expenses of this fiscal year. So how much is the budget now? Oh, the national budget is like three trillion. You know? three, three trillion something. I mean, I think three billion something. Billion. Sorry, three billion something a year. So, what will the government do? They push on taxation. They can raise revenue up to three billion pesos. So that is fiscal adequacy. So if you have enough taxation, if you have collected enough taxes, enough to pay your uh, fiscal year budget, so that meets fiscal adequacy. Okay. Another characteristic would be of a sound taxation would be theoretical justice. So what is this? Meaning it is, uh, there is equality. Meaning the imposition of taxes is equated with the ability to pay of the taxpayer. Yeah. So those who can pay higher taxes should have higher rates of taxes. Those who can pay lesser taxes because they are earning less should have lesser or lower rate of taxes. So that's why our tax rates is graduated, meaning it comes from 10% uh, then slowly graduates to 15%, 20%, 25%, then 32%. So it's not flat, no? It's graduated, it scales from the lowest, which is 10%, to 
to the highest, which is 32%. Because those who are earning less, they're only charged less. Those who are earning high, like more than 1 million pesos, I think the highest now is, uh, I think, uh, yeah, 1 million. They are charged 32% rate. Okay? So that is juridical justice. And that is what you call progressive system of taxation. Progressive. The lower rate, the lower income you have, the lower rate. The higher income you get, the higher tax you pay. That is progressive system of taxation found in Article 6 of Section 28, Section 28 of the Constitution. The third characteristic would, is the administrative feasibility. This means that tax law can reasonably be enforced, not unduly burdensome upon, nor discouraging to business activity. So it means that in the administration or implementing of the law, it should not be a burden sum. So it should not be a burden or should not discourage business businesses. No? So taxes should be capable of being in fact effectively enforced. So that's why trained law now, it's more simple and it can therefore be effectively enforced. Uh, let's say VAT, for instance, here. VAT could be cited as an example of administrative simplicity. It's very simple to apply. Why? Because there's only fixed rate of 12%. So here, the court, to this effect, ruled that the law is principally aimed to rationalize the system of taxes on goods and services, simplify tax administration, and make the system more equitable to enable the country to attain economic recovery VAT. Now VAT is a flat rate. It is uh, not progressive because the tax rate there is flat. And how much? It's 12%. Say for example, why it is uh, it is uh, not fair or what is unfair, it is unconstitutional. Why? Because it violates this rule, the progressive system of taxation. What is progressive system? The more income you have, the more the the the, the low income you get, the low tax you pay. The higher income you acquire, the higher taxes you pay. So that's progressive system. But in the matter of VAT, we pay the same rate. Now you, as students, when you buy, for example, uh, Coca-Cola or soft drink or soda drink for that matter, you pay VAT of 12%. Do you have income? The answer is no, you still study. You're still a student, you see? But on the other hand, if I will pay, if I will drink Coca-Cola, I also drink, I also pay 12% VAT. Is that fair? No, because I'm a lawyer, I'm a CPA, I'm an instructor, I'm a professor, I have so many income. But I only, if we pay the same, you pay 12%, I pay 12%. So. Is that fair? Of course it's not. But the Supreme Court says that VAT is an example of administrative simplicity. Now there were people against VAT, the implementation of VAT, and these are the kapatira ng mga naglilingkod sa pamahalaan versus tan. So they raise the question, is this tax a fair tax? Is VAT a fair tax? So this is answered here in this case. Okay. And what the Supreme Court said that the the the, the rationalized the purpose of this VAT is to rationalize the system of taxes on goods and services. 
in order to ha enable our country to attain economic recovery. It's true, because VAT is the one paying our loans to the uh, to foreign banks. No? Okay. The taxation is subject to limitations because this part of the tax is the strongest of all the powers. So it has to have to be limited. And the limitations is within the constitution and also it's inherent. It is inherent on, this, on the power itself. <clears throat> so let's go to inherent power. Uh, inherent limitations. So there are two limitations, no? Inherent limitations and constitutional limitations. Here, inherent and constitutional limitations. So there are, I think, five inherent limitations. Yes. There are five. Number one, inherent limitation. The purpose of collecting taxes is only one, and that is public purpose. <clears throat> there should be no other purpose. Why do you collect taxes? It's for public purpose. And who is the public? For us all, for our general welfare. <clears throat> so how do we test that it is public purpose? Number one, or letter A. So whether the thing to be furthered by the appropriation of public revenue is something which is the duty of the state as a government to provide. So they're collecting in order that the it is the duty of the state. Letter B, whether the process of tax will directly promote the welfare of community in equal measure. So these are the questions to answer. So if the answer are both in the affirmative, then that tax is valid. But if its answer is in the negative, then it does not conform with the public purpose. Number two, limitation. So, oh. We continue with public purpose, so it cannot be exercised in aid of enterprises, strictly private, or any individual for that matter. Though the line which distinguishes public use for which taxes may be assist, assessed from private use for which they may not. It's not always easy to discern. It's always the duty of the court to impose in property properly called on for the protection of the rights of the citizen and aid to prevent his private property from being lawfully appropriated to the use of others. So there are cases to support this theory. So we'll discuss only one case here. Uh, citizen Savings and Loan Association of Cleveland versus Topica City. Now, a statute which authorizes towns to issue bonds in aid of manufacturing enterprises of individuals is void. Because the taxes necessary to pay bonds would be a transfer property of individuals to aid the projects of gain and profit of others and not for public use. So here the city it issues bonds or float bonds. So what are bonds? Bonds are certificates of liability of obligation. So if I have money, I will buy, buy bonds and my money goes to the to the city, <clears throat> which in turn the city will pay me in the future with interest. Okay. But the purpose of raising these bonds or the money, raising money is to help or aid the manufacturing enterprises of individuals. And that is void. Because why? Because it's not public. Specifically, individuals. So certain 
not the whole public, but only to certain individuals. So that makes the taxing power void. Right, let's go to the second inherent <clears throat> limitation. That is the non-delegability of the taxing power. <clears throat> we have partly discussed this before. <clears throat> the power of taxation <clears throat> is peculiarly, peculiarly and exclusively legislative. So only the legislative <clears throat> branch of the government can exercise. Consequently, the taxing power as a general rule may not be delegated. <clears throat> <clears throat> Again, the, the exceptions are the following. No? <clears throat> Which I have already mentioned, and that is the authority given to the president to fix tariff rates, <clears throat> import and export quotas, tonnage and warfage, juice, and other imposed or duties. Also in the Article 10 of the Constitution, <clears throat> which states that each local government can create its own sources of revenue <clears throat> and to levy taxes and fees and other charges. Now the down delegability power <clears throat> of the, the legislative power <clears throat> are these, they cannot be delegated <clears throat> to the selection of property to be taxed determination of purpose, the fixing of the rate of taxation, the rules of taxation in general. But they can delegate its administrative implementing uh, rules. Let's go to the third inherent limitation which is territoriality or situs of taxation, meaning the place of taxation. Congress can only exact taxes within its jurisdiction, within, within its territorial jurisdiction, meaning within the boundary of the Philippines, or Cebu City can only collect within the boundary of Cebu City, can't go to Iloilo City. It's not within their jurisdiction. So that's the limitation. So power of taxation is necessarily limited only to persons, property, or business within its jurisdiction, that is to say within its jurisdiction or within its exercise dominion. It should be within its location. So the maximum mobilia sicco tour personam means movables follow the person. So if you are a person, and you are subjected to Philippine taxation, your property can be subjected to the taxes. No? This is what the maxim or the theory states, mobilia sicuntur persona. Let's say I am a Filipino, me, attorney Masenin. I have properties in the US. <clears throat> That's beyond the jurisdiction of the state. The Philippine, Philippine state, because it's in the U.S. If I sell my property in the U.S., will I pay taxes here in the Philippines? That's what. That's not within the jurisdiction of the state. The Philippines. What's the answer to the question? Will I pay taxes for selling my property, which is located in the United States of America? The answer is yes, because of this maxim, mobilia sicuntur persona. So this is an exception to the rule of territoriality or situs of taxation. So according to this maxim, the situs of pers personal property is the domicile of the owner. So we're talking about personal property. <clears throat> so when to apply? In the case of Wells Fargo Bank, this is a US-based bank versus collector. The Supreme Court ruled that the shares of stock left behind by a non-resident citizen, dissident, meaning he, this, dissident, you know what is the dissident? 
one who is already dead, no? Person who is already uh, person who is already dead, and he owns stocks, but he is non-resident here in the Philippines. So he owns stocks in a partnership in the Philippines and are subject to Philippine inheritance tax, <clears throat> notwithstanding the mobilia rule. So the mobilia rule should yield to reason. Oh, so the, my example a while ago was is not correct, no? So this is the personal, this pertains only to personal uh, properties like stocks. So here there is a person, let's say a US citizen, he is non-resident here in the Philippines, but he owns stocks here in the Philippines. Okay? Let's say he has shares of stocks with Ayala, <clears throat> Ayala Holdings. When he died there in the US, <clears throat> his shares here will be subjected to <clears throat> Philippine estate tax or inheritance tax. So there was a case already. Hey, why are you... Uh, collecting tax when there is this rule mobilia si contour personam that the person's property which are movables or which are a personal property should follow the person only the US should tax that not you <clears throat> not you Filipinos but it is <clears throat> but in this case the Supreme Court said that the mobilia rule should yield to reason <clears throat> The shares of stocks are also taxable in the Philippines or in their situs of their actual location. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, in those cases when the situs for certain intangibles are intercategorially spelled out in the statute, there is room for applying in the mobilia rule. So meaning if it is all it is uh, stated in the statute itself, then you cannot implement. <clears throat> so there, there are, uh, there is a law requiring persons to pay taxes here in the Philippines if they own intangible properties. So, example, intangible properties are franchise, shares, obligations, or bonds, or rights in any partnership. Okay. So if you own franchise, if if there's a if there's a non-resident alien who owns franchises here in the Philippines, it is subjected to tax here in the Philippines, and so on and so forth. No? Okay. Fourth, <clears throat> except uh, inherent liability, uh, inherent limitation. Is tax exemption of government. So, as a matter of public policy, the property of the state or any of its political subdivisions devoted to government uses or purposes are generally exempt from taxation. So, meaning the tax, meaning the government cannot tax itself. No, it's a, it's a, it's a futile effort or a waste of time but we have a question here can the government tax itself the answer is yes in one case the supreme court held that there is no constitutional limitation of power of congress to tax the afp or the armed forces of the philippines if it wishes to do so that's the bisaya land transportation company versus the collector also <clears throat> the local government cannot exempt the national government or vice versa, the national government cannot, will not exempt the local government. Like for instance, in the in Lapu-Lapu City, the city hall now is asking for payment of real property taxes for uh, maps. You know what is maps? That's the Mactan Export Processing Zone Authority, big property, owned by also by another government agency, which is the PESA. PESA is the Philippine Export Zone Authority. So PESA owns these lands 
and they're not paying any real property taxes since time immemorial. Now, Lapu-Lapu City is asking them, hey, you should pay real property taxes. <clears throat> so this inherent limitation is now waving. No? It's no longer, uh, it's not applicable. It can only be applicable when it comes to the same government, like national government exempting another national agency. Let's say, for example, uh, BIR is collecting from DILG. So it can be applied, this exemption. Fifth, inherent limitation, international committee. What is an international committee? It is founded on rule of reciprocity or amity of nations. So amity is friendship of nations. Reciprocity is mutual, like mutuality. So example, EG is example. U.S. Embassy is not subjected to property tax here in the Philippines. So U.S. Embassy, we're talking about U.S. Embassy in Manila or in the Philippines. They're not subjected to property tax. And in the same token, our consulate, offices or the Philippine consulates which are located in the US, like in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in New York, New Jersey, they're not also subjected to property tax. Okay? So that is international comedy. So those are the inherent limitations. The other kind of limitation is the constitutional limitations. Constitutional because these limitations are found in the constitution itself. So the first constitutional limitation is the due process of law. This is found in Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution. And it states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So this requires that the tax must be for public purpose, the imposition must be within its local or territorial jurisdiction, and there is no arbitrariness or oppression in assessment and in collection. However, it does not require determination to judicial inquiry of property subject to tax, of the amount of tax to be imposed, notice and hearing as to the amount of tax and the matter of apportionment for reason of lifeblood theory or the necessity theory. <coughs> so what are the instances where this due process clause may be invoked? Number one, when there is a clear contravention of inherent or constitutional limitations in the exercise of the tax power. So we already talked about inherent limitations. So if there is a violation on that, so we can invoke due process. Number two, where tax measure becomes so unconscionable and unjust as to the amount of confiscation of property. Okay, the rate here or the tax is so unconscionable. What is unconscionable? Meaning it's so unjust, it cannot be uh, absorbed by the conscience, by conscience. The amount is so big, so huge. Uh, so it tantamounts to confis confiscation of property already. So in the case of Kapatiran versus Stan, the Supreme Court ruled that due process was not violated by the VAT law. It's another case of VAT because there is no grave abuse of discretion incident to the promulgation of the VAT. Now the petitioners in the case failed to show that Executive Order 273 was issued capriciously or in an arbitrary manner by passion or personal hostility since it appears that a comprehensive study of the VAT was made before the Executive Order was issued. So we cannot, uh, we cannot go against the payment of VAT. In the case of Sison versus Ancheta, Supreme Court ruled that the modified scheduler income tax is not a denial of due process because there is no proof 
of arbitrariness in exposition of the tax rates. So arbitrariness comes only when there is uh, the imposition is uh, expedient, there was no notice to the public, there was no public uh, hearing, there were no public hearings or, or solicitation of questions from the public. So in order to avoid this, that's why there is always publication in the newspaper. But uh, whenever there are taxes to be increased, or when the schedule of tax rates are are changed, or tax payment due are changed by the BIR, or when the zonal values are changed, you know? because zonal values of properties are bound to be changed every three years. <clears throat> So before the BIR or Department of Finance changed it or modifies it, there should be public hearing. And after public hearing, if there is no, no more objection, then publication. Then when that happens, the Supreme Court will rule that there is no proof of arbitrariness in the imposition of the tax. Okay, number two, Constitutional limitation still found in under section one of article three of the constitution, which is the equal protection of the law, that no person shall be deprived or denied the equal protection of the law. So the state has the power to make reasonable and natural classification for purposes of taxation. However, the classification must be based upon real and substantial difference between the persons, property, our privileges and those that taxed must bear some reasonable relation to the object or purpose of legislation. And then the equality of taxation means that all persons who are similarly situated should be treated alike both in privilege conferred and burdens imposed. So if we are situated in the same manner, then we should be conferred with the same tax same tax. And number three, it requires that taxes treat persons who are similarly situated in the same manner. So that is the equal protection of the law. You just remember this one. The taxes should, it requires that taxes treat persons who are similarly situated in the same manner. So if I am earning this much, you should also I should pay this much. And if you're earning the same, you should pay the same. No discrimination. Number three, constitutional limitation found in Article 6 of Section 28. It requires that the rule of taxation should be uniform and equitable. And that Congress should evolve or shall evolve a progressive system of taxation. We already discussed progressive and is found here in number three. <clears throat> Taxation is progressive when its rates when its rate goes up depending on the resources of the person affected. <clears throat> so it goes up when you have higher income. Now uniformity means that all taxable articles or kinds of property of the same class <clears throat> should, should be taxed at the same rate. Same as equality. <clears throat> Different articles or other subjects like transactions, business rights, may be taxed at different rates, provided that the rate, that necessarily the amount is uniform in the same class everywhere. A tax is uniform and it operates with the same force and effect in every place where the subject of it is found. It requires that there should be no direct duplicate taxation. <clears throat> so what are the requisites for uniformity? It is based upon substantial distinctions, which made real differences. It is German or relevant to the purpose of the legislation or ordinance. It applies not only to present conditions, but also to future conditions, substantially identical to those of the present 
and it applies equally to all those who belong to the same class. That's the requisites of uniformity. <clears throat> so if there's a question, what are the requisites of uniformity? And these are the answer. One, two, three, four. Very long answers. Let's go to equitability. Equitability notes that taxation is said to be equitable when its burden falls on those better able to pay. So equitability means that it also means the taxpayer's ability to pay. So taxation may be uniform but inequitable where the amount of tax imposed is excessive or unreasonable. So equitability means taxpayer's ability to pay. <clears throat> okay. Fourth, the non-impairment of co contracts. Uh, we discussed this already, no? That if there's a contract and government should not make laws that would impair the rights and obligations found in the contracts. Number five, the rule of no imp imprisonment for non-payment of pool tax found in Article 3 of Section 20 of the Constitution. That if you don't pay your debts or do you, you don't pay pool tax, then you cannot be imprisoned. What are pool taxes? Pool tax are also known as cedula. No? If you have no cedula, none, you have not paid your, which is now known as community tax receipt. That is pool tax. Number six, origin of appropriation, revenue, and tariff bills must uh, comes, come from the, or originate exclusively in the House of Representatives and not the Senate. The Senate may only propose or concur amendments to it. No? So appropriation, revenue, tariff bills, all bills regarding taxes must come from the lower house or House of Representatives, not House of Senate. Number seven, non-infringement of religious freedom and worship. Found in Article 3, Section 24 of the Constitution, says that no law shall be made respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship without discrimination and preference shall, be, shall forever be allowed. So no religious tests shall be required for the exercise of civil or political rights. So in the case of American Bible Society versus City of Manila, the Supreme Court ruled that a municipal license tax on the sale of Bibles and religious articles by a non-profit non missionary organization of a little profit constitutes a curtailment of religious freedom and worship, which is guaranteed by the Constitution. What is a curtail curtailment? It is a restriction. So if you if if the government requires payment of taxes, if you sell Bibles, that's already a curtailment or restriction. You are restricting the freedom to exercise religion. Number eight, delegation of the legislative authority to fix tariff rates, import and quotas, export quotas to the president. So we have already discussed this. Then there is the tax exemption of properties actually and exclusively used for religious, charitable and educational purposes. So religious, charitable, educational purposes. So under Section 28 of Article 6 of the Constitution, charitable institutions, churches, and parsonages, or convents, mosques, nonprofit cemeteries, and all lands, buildings, and improvements actually directly and exclusively used for religious, charitable, or educational purpose shall be exempt from taxation. So no 
property tax. We're talking about property taxes here. So the Supreme Court ruled the constitutional exemption applies only to property tax here, property tax. So if there are gifts, donations to church, oh, still subject to donor's tax. If the property is given to the church, subject to donor's tax. Uh, given by a private person. In another case, gifts made in favor of religious, charitable, or educational institutions would nevertheless qualify for donor's gift tax exemption. So, but there is a gift tax exemption if you give to these uh, organizations. Okay. <clears throat> Number 10, voting requirement in connection with legislative grant of tax exemptions. The, the Constitution in Article 6 states that there should be no law granting any tax exemption without the concurrence of majority of all members of Congress. So this is kind of big because Congress is uh, Congress is composed of House of Representative and House of Senate. So it requires both majority of the representative and the Senate. And in number eleven, the non impairment of the Supreme Court's jurisdiction in tax cases. So if ever there is a case which is filed in court. So the Supreme Court has jurisdiction in this subject matter. So it should not be impaired. Only the, juris the Supreme Court has supreme rule and supreme jurisdiction. Number 12, tax exemption of revenues and assets, including grants, endowments, donations, or contributions to educational institutions are also exempt from taxes and duties. Okay, educational institutions. No? If uh, you are going to give, or donate, contribute to non-profit, non-stock educational institutions. So if you donate property to CITU, you have to pay taxes, donors tax, because CITU is a not, not a non-profit educational institution, it is a proprietary educational institution institution <clears throat> and there are other provisions in the Constitution which also relate to taxation like the power of the president to veto item or items in the appropriation or revenue tariff bill so the president can veto the the appropriation or budget the necessity of an appropriation made for money may be paid out of the Treasury so meaning that if there are funds already in the treasury, it cannot be, it cannot come, come out without appropriation bill. So appropriation bill comes from Congress. So Congress must enact a law approving the withdrawal of money and payment and the use of that money. Then the provision against the appropriation of public money or property for the benefit of any church, sect, or religious religion is not allowed. No, so the state should not appropriate a, a money for the purpose of giving it to any church. The constitutional provision on taxes limited for personal purpose and allotments to local governments. <clears throat> and that ends our <clears throat> discussion of part one. <clears throat> this is a chapter one of your book. You can use any tax book for this matter. And uh, for any questions or clarifications, you can email me at my Gmail account, Masarin and Masarin Law, or my FB account, Attorney London Mac. This is your host, instructor, and moderator saying, Have a good day and thank you for listening.